Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere, and even earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then, you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for Podcasters, I feel like I've been having a lot more connection with my listeners through the Q&As and polls. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com forward slash podcasters to get started. Hi everyone, I'm Amber Rose, the Religious Hippie, and welcome to A Catholic's Perspective. For those of you just finding this podcast, let me tell you a little about myself. I was born and raised a cradle Catholic until I fell away from the church for eight years. I just recently came back to the church and I could not be happier with where I am today. I am currently a junior in college and I'm studying graphic design. I am an ambassador for multiple amazing Catholic Christian companies and I love working with all of them. Now, some of you may already know me from my popular religious hippie social media channels, such as TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I have all kinds of Catholic content on there, so don't forget to go check those out. So the reason I wanted to start a podcast was so that I'd be able to have a longer format which people could listen to from wherever they are. I particularly wanted to address issues that young Catholics face today in the secular world, and I want to do that by providing information along with commentary and even a little of my own opinion. I can't lie, from time to time I might be discussing very controversial issues, and some will find my opinions unappealing. But I do this out of my faith and service to God. We must keep communicating with each other, respecting each other, and put each other on the path to sainthood. I think you'll enjoy the podcasts coming up, and I thank you for being here with me. Hey everyone, and welcome back to my podcast. If you're new here, welcome. I'm Amber Rose, also known as the Religious Hippie. And today I have a special guest, Father Dan Duplantis. Welcome, Father Dan. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for welcoming me back. It's good to be here again. It's great to have you back. So today we're going to be discussing the sacraments. This has been a highly requested video, but I decided to do it in a podcast form just because I felt like it would be easier to discuss it with you and with um, my following and everything like that. So I think today's going to be a great podcast. Cool. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Awesome. So I guess we're just going to kind of jump right in here. Um, The first thing I wanted to address is what are the sacraments? Yeah. So rather than give the catechetical definitions, I figured I'd try to maybe summarize it uh, in maybe more simple terms. Uh, Obviously, the catechism is going to have the best answers for this. um, And you can look that it's usually the beginning of the section on liturgy in the catechism. Uh, But basically what the sacraments are, uh, just to kind of simplify things, Um, it's, it's, we describe them as like tangible signs or like physical signs or some kind of reality, some kind of action or symbol, um, that also has a corresponding reality to it. Um, and so there's always in a sense, we, in, in the Latin terms are the, the res tantum, the sacramentum tantum and the res et sacramentum. So it's like, there's always like a thing or an object, an action that simplifies or signifies, uh, something that's happening spiritually. Uh, and the sacraments are the means by which graces are given by God, specifically to do um, certain actions within the church. Wow, that's really great. That's a great explanation. I know a lot of people get confused about what they are, so that's great. Um, the next thing that I, a question I get a lot is, where did the sacraments originate from? So you could say they originate in a few different ways. Um, first of all, their author is God, uh, God who wills that we be able to perceive the things that he's trying to do in our lives through, um, I would say, the, um, the dualistic aspect of us as being both body and spirit. We're a composite whole of those two things. So with that in mind, he is the author of those things specifically for uh, us to be able to experience uh, both realities, the physical and the spiritual. Uh, but where we see them come from also um, is, is at different points throughout scripture as well. 
um, uh, but mostly through the, the institution of Christ himself. Most of the sacraments we will see Christ instituting directly, uh, or in some senses, as we'll see in one of the sacraments later, um, he elevates one that was already pre-existent before his first coming. Okay, very cool. Yeah, I know a lot of times people get confused about, you know, what the sacraments are, where they came from and everything. I think, um, I don't know, I feel like a lot of those answers can be, or questions could be answered by priests such as yourself, but mm. also doing some more research into it. Um, is there a specific um, place you would suggest people to go get research when learning about the sacraments? Uh, yeah, actually, there was a really cool website I found earlier. If I could find it, that would be awesome. Um, basically, I think it's called like Catholic Fidelity or ChristianFidelity.com, something like that. Basically, what I would do is just uh, is to Google like scripture on different sacraments. Um, and so if you do that, you can normally find several different sources. Um, usually like catholicanswers.com is one of the best sources just for anyone. It's, I consider that to be like Catholic Google. Um, and that's always been a really, really good source, um, especially because you can find just about anything on it. But um, that there's several books out there. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of it just comes down to uh, uh, looking for the best that you can. Um, and there's so many different sources, podcasts like yours, um, different, uh, like you can find Father Mike Schmitz. There's all kinds of stuff out there. Just you could Google it and you can find it. Awesome. Why do we need the sacraments? I think this is one of the biggest questions that I'm always asked because a lot of our uh, Protestant brothers and sisters say that they don't need the sacraments because Jesus gives them everything they need, etc. So why do we need the sacraments? I think a big part of that comes again from like the certainty of knowing that by doing certain actions, um, so we would call that uh, or like the matter and form of the sacraments, and I'll, I'll, I'll briefly describe those. The matter is like the action or the thing that is needed for the sacrament. The form is usually the words that are said to affect the sacrament. Um, both of those things together give us the certainty that these acts are being given, that the grace is actually being dispensed uh, through the authority of the church itself. Um, we cannot have sacraments without the church. Um, they're, they're, they kind of go together. Uh, and so in a sense, it's the authority of the church giving us a certain sense of certainty um, to actually know what's going on. And again, it feeds into the fact that we're body and soul. So that, for example, I, I, I had mentioned this, I think in the last episode I came on for here uh, with confession, was that hearing the words of absolution feeds into the, the physical aspect of hearing, uh, but then also nourishes us like, like mentally, like to know uh, that we've been forgiven, but then also spiritually, like there's, there's the sense of heaviness that's lifted in confession. Uh, when you get to actually hear the words of absolution, that by pouring out the sins, there's this, this cathartic sense of self-emptying, uh, and then receiving the words themselves of the priest or, or whatever actions being done. Um, in a sense, it, it ministers to the whole person. And I think that's basically why we need the sacraments, is ministry to the whole person, not just certain aspects of the person. Totally agree. Absolutely. I know, especially in confession and things like that, people think confession is the most scariest thing in the world. And I'm not, I mean, when I, obviously when I first came back into my faith, I didn't really understand it 100% yet. So I was like, but I knew it was the step in coming back to my faith and in being able to receive um, Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. Right. Um, but in those instances, people always say that confession is like the scariest thing and that, you know, they, um, I think we talked about this in the last podcast you were on about how people just have this innate fear of confession for some reason. I know this is an, in, a question that we uh, discussed, but in general, why do you think there's that fear? I think a lot of the fear comes from shame. Um, I think people are just in general are ashamed of the sins they're coming to confess and, and depending on the sin. Um, I, I think what tends to happen is Satan tends to work in such a way that he wants us to feel two things. He wants us to feel both um, alone and in the dark. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's, that's the kind of things that going to confession helps with um, is that one, like you're bringing it to the church, you're taking it out of the dark. Uh, and at the same time, like someone else knows this isn't the burden you have to carry by yourself anymore. And like, you're able like to, to give it to Christ, just like, like in the old Testament, Aaron would like actually confess the sins of the people onto the scapegoat. 
um, for Yom Kippur. Same concept, like, like being able like, to have the sense that someone else knows, even though the sense like a goat knowing your sins doesn't really do anything. Um, but uh, at least like, like someone knows and you're not in the dark. It's brought to the light and that's where you can grow the most is when we know we're not alone. We feel like we don't have to carry this by ourselves. Uh, and then also the fact that, um, yeah, it's brought to the light in, in, in many ways that helps us to be able to grow so that someone else can help us, can help us see the light with these things. So that's the thing, shame. Shame is what brings people the most fear, I think, with confession. Um, it's already embarrassing enough to have to, to spill the ordinary junk of our lives, but to have to spill our sins to somebody else um, takes a lot of humility, but there's also a lot of shame people battle with. Right. No, absolutely. I think that's definitely a part of it. I mean, I, I know for a fact, it's like when you're standing in that confessional line, you're just like, I, I don't really know how to explain it, but you kind of anticipate that the priest is for some reason going to be mad at you or something, which they never are, at least in mm. my experience. I know there are some priests out there who, who might get a little frustrated every now and then, but for the most part, there are amazing priests like yourself. And when you actually get in there, it's just, you just fill your guts, you know, and it's so refreshing and just honestly real, it's like a relief to have somebody else know about this stuff. Like you're not carrying it, you know, by yourself anymore. There, there's a second person who's there and you, and they give you absolution, you know, from Jesus Christ and you are forgiven completely. And I think that feeling overpowers any feeling of shame that I've ever felt at least. Without a doubt. And you could look at just about any kind of like self-help programs or, or like anything like Alcoholics Anonymous or people recovering from different types of addictions or, or even like diets, you know, different health and wellness programs, exercise and going to the gym. Um, the thing that makes a lot of these programs as successful as they are or as they can be, I should say, uh, is accountability. And that accountability goes the same thing with the spiritual life is having that accountability, like the, the church keeping us accountable through confession, giving us dependence to help us to grow. Um, accountability is what helps to overcome a lot of these things. Yeah. Right. Which is so important. And piggybacking off of that, um, how can the how can the sacraments deepen our faith? I think in many ways, like the ability of the sacraments to deepen our faith has to do with how well we're able to enter into them as well. Um, is, is first of all, simply like, like paying attention to the rites. Uh, I know sometimes people don't get to go to a lot of the different sacraments in the church. You know, most people, it, it, amazingly, there's a lot of people who've never been to an ordination um, who don't understand the signs of the rite of ordination. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's oftentimes confusing for people who go to different sacraments for the first time. Um, and so like our ability to enter into the sacraments and for it to deepen our faith has to do with maybe doing our homework beforehand. Like if you know you're about to go to an ordination and you've never been to one before, there's tons of articles online you can find about what goes on, the different symbolisms of the ordination, things like that. Um, so I think a lot of it is familiarity with the rites helps us to deepen uh, what's going on. And then once we understand what's happening with the different signs and actions and different rites of the sacraments, um, I think from there, we're able to appreciate, and, and it really just kind of helps us to understand more of who God is and how he operates. And I think that's the bottom line of um, how can it deepen our faith is by understanding God more. Right. Which is the whole point of the Catholic church is to understand right. God and to follow him and his teachings and the apostles' orals, teachings and traditions and things, which is so important. Um, for those who may not know what the sacraments of the church are, would you mind listing off the Catholic church sacraments real fast? Yeah, for sure. Um, there are seven sacraments and we can break them down into three groups. Uh, the first one is what we call the sacraments of initiation. And these are baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. Um, and what happens is when you go through the rite of Christian initiation for adults, uh, which many converts end up going through, most of the time you receive all three of those at the same mass. Um, then we have what's called the sacraments of healing. Um, and so these uh, help to heal both body and soul. Um, we have the sacrament of reconciliation, also known as confession or the sacrament of penance. And then we also have uh, anointing of the sick, uh, which is especially for those who are going through different serious illnesses, people undergoing surgeries, uh, people who are dying. Um, sacraments of healing is what we call those. Uh, and then we have what we call the sacraments of service. Uh, and these sacraments specifically are for states of life. Uh, and these two include the sacrament of matrimony, uh, so marriage, uh, where a man and a woman become one flesh, and in a sense come to serve each other and also the church. 
And then the sacrament of holy orders, which is the sacrament conferred upon a man for the ordination to either the diaconate, the priesthood, or the episcopacy. Uh, so he's ordained to serve the church. So that's our seven sacraments. That's awesome. I know because there are there might be some non-Catholics or or Catholics even who don't understand the sacraments or which sacraments are which or you know the categories that they're put into. So that's very helpful. And you know, I always get the question of, oh, you know, Constantine started the Catholic Church and things like that. Obviously, we know that Christianity, Catholicism was around way before Constantine, but a lot of people believe that the sacraments came after Jesus. Can you, um, can you go into a little detail about who instituted the sacraments? Right. We would say that Christ institutes them, or like in the case I said earlier, there's one that's elevated. Um, you think, can you take a guess at which one was elevated? Uh, the Eucharist? No, actually it wasn't. Oh, think of sure. way in the beginning, going back to Genesis. Oh my goodness. Uh, confession? No, matrimony. Matrimony. Oh my matrimony, gosh. Matrimony, really? the first wedding between Adam and Eve. Yep. Yep. Really? So that's the one we would say that that was elevated to um, the, we would say the dignity of a sacrament. Um, wow. and so in that case, cause you look at, I even like throughout the old Testament, um, how many times the relationship between God and Israel is described as almost like this marriage, mm -hmm. uh, so many different figures. Like you have Hosea, um, who marries a harlot named Gomer, you know, and so that's symbolic of God in the church. Or you look at the song of songs, which is completely about the relationship, like the marriage covenant between God and his people. Uh, so marriage as an institution is instituted by God from the get-go, um, and then is later, we would say, elevated to the dignity of sacrament for the conferral of grace. Um, so yeah, so Christ institutes the sacraments, uh, and, and the cool thing is that we can see about every single sacrament, uh, like where he institutes them in the scriptures, um, or at least we could say also for the sake of matrimony, the elevation of them in the scriptures. Uh, so if we could even talk about that if you'd like, like where you could find these in scripture. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's the thing. There's so many different passages. You can, you can find dozens for each of these, but I'm kind of going to highlight, um, mostly the, the important ones here. Uh, so like for baptism, uh, John chapter three, verse five is where Nicodemus approaches Jesus and Jesus tells him, you must be born again of water and spirit, uh, the necessity of baptism. We have the, uh, the great commission at the end of Matthew's gospel. This is Matthew 28, 19. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Um, this is really important maybe for our Protestant brothers and sisters as well, uh, is where we find a scriptural basis for infant baptism. Uh, and that's in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 to 39, where um, we hear them say to repent and be baptized. And later at the end of verse 39, the promise is made to you and your children. Uh, so the idea that like being able to bestow baptism on children or the baptism of whole households we hear all throughout Acts of the Apostles. Uh, confirmation uh, finds its roots in Pentecost itself. We say that confirmation is the sacrament of Pentecost. Uh, so with that, you can look to uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, uh, where the Holy Spirit descends upon the Apostles. Uh, Acts chapter 8, 14 through 16 is really, really important for distinguishing Pentecost as its own sacrament. Uh, so it says they sent Peter and John who came down and prayed for them. This is uh, in, in the area there uh, that they might receive the Holy Spirit for it had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So in that passage, what we're seeing is a distinction between baptism and the coming down of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so in there, we see that there is a, a different conferral of grace through the Holy Spirit for confirmation. Um, Eucharist, there's, there's some really, really good ones here. Uh, the big one is John chapter 6, verses 25 through 67. This is what's known as the bread of life discourse. Uh, and if you ever get to read any of Dr. P Brant Petrie's works, uh, he credits a big part of his conversion story with John chapter 6. Uh, and he even wrote a whole book on the significance of that. Um, and so that's a very big passage where Jesus says it's something like, I think, uh, like, seven times in five verses, the necessity of eating his flesh and drinking his, his blood, and then saying my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. Like that's not symbolic language, it's a very real language there. Um, and then St. Paul also recounts um, the Eucharist, like the, the, the association of the bread with the body and the chalice with, with his blood in 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, reconciliation, uh, we even see in several places. We look in John's gospel, this is uh, chapter 20, verse 23. 
uh, is first of all, Christ giving the apostles the authority to forgive sins. He says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Then in uh, the epistles, this is the epistle of James chapter five, verse 16. He says, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. So there's this association with healing in the confession of sins, uh, anointing of the sick. Uh, again, in James, this is James 5, verse 14. Uh, is there anyone who is sick among you? Let them send for the priest of the church to pray over them and anoint them with the oil in the name of the Lord. So very specifically, instructions right there for the anointing of a sick person by the priest. Matrimony. Um, there's several places, again, in the Old Testament we see this. Um, but I think the best summary of what it is as a sacrament is in Ephesians 5, verse 22 to 32. Uh, this is a reading that's often picked for weddings, uh, which uh, sometimes gets a little uncomfortable to preach about from my perspective, uh, because this is the one that says, uh, husbands, be submissive to your wives. And sometimes you see the groom kind of, you see the groom nudging his bride and, you know, he's like, you hear that? But then it says, husbands, love your brides as Christ loved the church. Um, it's like, that's a sacrificial love. So that's where the bride should be, you know, nudging her husband saying, ha, you hear that one? <laughs> um, but with that one, I love the saying. So that passage finishes with the summary of the two becoming one flesh. So that's like what's happening in the reality of the sacrament. But then what does that signify? Um, in the end of that passage says, um, this mystery is a profound one. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So matrimony symbolizing um, the reality of Christ taking the church as his bride and husband and wife are the symbols of that in the reality of that as well. And then finally, holy orders. Uh, so the sacramental priesthood itself originates at the last supper. Um, and that's detailed in all three synoptic gospels. You could find that there, um, which is really interesting too, because usually on Holy Thursday is where most dioceses throughout the world celebrate the chrism mass, which is where the priests will actually renew their promises to the bishop um, it's the celebration of the anniversary of the priesthood. Um, and then also in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four, 24, uh, St. Paul saying, do this in remembrance of me. And so this is a command from Christ for the apostles to continue offering this sacrificial meal. And the reality is anything that's sacrificial is the nature of the priesthood. And so that's where we get this idea of this as priests, not just, you know, we hear the word presbyteros in the gospels, and also in, in the New Testament, translated as elders, which it is, uh, but that's also the name we use for the priesthood now, the presbyterate. Um, but there's something they associated the actions of um, the priesthood with sacrifice. So we use the term priesthood very fittingly because of its sacrificial nature. So that kind of sums up, you know, the most important scriptures, I think, for each of these sacraments. No, yeah, that's very cool. And I know a lot of people, you know, always ask, they're like, where is that in the Bible? And where is this in the Bible? And, you know, <laughs> that doesn't really work for us as Catholics, because yes, we do see the Bible as the word of God, and it does hold, you know, a lot of, but we also look at the sacred traditions. And so when people tell us where's that in the Bible, we are literally just like, well, that doesn't really apply to us, because that's not what we believe. And so if you want to hear our perspective, you got to go back in tradition too. And tradition, I feel like from the early church fathers, the disciples, the apostles, the saints and everything, they all point towards the sacraments in the Catholic church. All of them, anyone who would read this early writings of the church fathers or anything could not look at it and say, oh, that's Protestant. They would look at it and go, that aligns with Catholic doctrine, that right. aligns with the Catholic teaching. And so I think it's important for people to understand that the, like the Bible is a Catholic book. We compiled it, you know, and it wasn't until later that books were taken out and it was, you know, altered and things of that nature for different religions based off of what people wanted it to say so that they could follow their lives. But this still proves that there are sacraments in the Bible, you know, it, and you don't even have to. I don't know, I guess, change the wording or anything to prove it. It's right there. You don't have to dig deep into it. You don't have to be like, oh, well, this is a metaphor for this. It's, it's just so straightforward, I feel like. Yeah, it is. And you bring up a really important point, the fact that, you know, we could say like sacred scripture 
uh, is part of the deposit of faith with sacred tradition, but in a sense also, uh, sacred scripture comes from the sacred tradition. Uh, you're right, like the church compiled the Bible. Uh, it didn't just fall out of the sky. It doesn't fall out of the sky in English from the King James Version, you know. Um, <laughs> it's, it, and when you ask that question, like, where does the Bible come from? Uh, we have to remember it's a collection of books. That's what the word, like, like, like you think of in many languages, like French and Spanish, a lot of the Romance language, Biblios means like a collection of books or like a mm -hmm. library. That's what a library is. Uh, like bibliothèque, biblioteca, all these words we hear in these languages, same concept. Uh, and so it's a collection of books, but you're right. It comes from the tradition of the church and you can find all kinds of documents in the church fathers um, that list, like these are the books in the canon of sacred scripture. And if anyone says otherwise, let them be anathema, which almost basically means like, let them be excommunicated, you know? Right. And so like, it says that, like we've had the, 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 I guess you could say the canonized version of sacred scripture um, I, I think at least since like the fifth century, since St. Jerome actually translated it from the original text into Latin. And so it's been around for a long time in that form. No, for sure. And I think that's always something that's interesting. Also, I see many non-Catholics, especially on TikTok and social media and stuff. And it seems to be that they don't understand that the Bible is all God's word, not just the parts where Jesus speaks, but in fact, every single word in that Bible is from God. And right. maybe he used other people to portray what he wanted or to say what he wanted to say to us, but it's all from God. It's not just like, oh, Jesus said this or Jesus said that and that's God. No, it's everything. And I think it's really important. I wanted to circle back a little bit to that uh, Eucharist, to the Eucharist. And when we hear Jesus speak about the Eucharist and you know he was telling his group of disciples followers basically that like um he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have eternal life many many people turn away from him and are just like who is he to say this like this is weird basically and he looks to his 12 apostles and he goes are you going to leave me too and the only way I can think of that is you know these 4,000 Protestant denominations and the Catholic church, you know, people who want to follow Christ, who, who follow Christ, but as soon as something they disagree with pops up or something, they walk away and they follow their own ideas of what following Christ is like. And that was something that always kind of stuck with me because it just breaks my heart that they're missing out on one of the most amazing things the Eucharist, literally Jesus Christ. And I don't know, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, I, I can tell you, especially as a priest, uh, it's, it's always a very humbling experience. And, and I hope I never take this for granted uh, ever as a priest is, is like actually being able to celebrate mass and to say those words, you know, like this is my body, this is my blood given for you. Um, and it's amazing. Like you just, you could, I, I could tell you, like, I could always tell there was a difference like before ordination and after ordination, like something you, I, I could feel it, like something changed because that's what we believe ordination does, especially uh, is it changes the being of the priest. Um, and so like to be like to, to offer that and like to, to say, this is my body, this is my blood. Um, and like, you just know, like, I just feel like I just know like this is, this is real, you know? Um, right. Like it has to be, uh, and it's, it's just a beautiful thing and, and to, to offer myself in that way as a priest, like, you know, when, no matter what's happening, like, you know, for me, like, you know, we go through hard days as priests too, and to offer all those things, to offer ourselves, whatever sacrifice we need to offer, uh, when people ask us to pray for them, is to offer that and to say, I'm giving myself with Christ uh, in the sacrifice, and it is such a beautiful thing, um, definitely something, uh, again, I think most priests would say we enjoy most of celebrating Mass. Absolutely. And I know you work with a lot of college students and stuff. How have you seen the sacraments improve their life and how it's changed them? Oh, my. I mean, we've we had a, a great bunch of college students and I'm at the cathedral in Homa now. But when I was at the university um, for them, uh, you could just see that they were they were questioning things as well. They're trying to figure all this out. Uh, but I think the more they just kind of dived into it, uh, not to say blindly, but I think in many ways, just at least on faith, um, the more they started to realize that there is something here, that you have to go deeper. And so many of them, we had a perpetual adoration chapel at the university. Many of them would sign up for holy hours, even late at night. Um, I, I remember I had the uh, 
Saturday evening, 11 p.m. hour. And, and I always was relieved by uh, one of our sorority girls. Uh, they, the sororities themselves sometimes would even have a slot where they would rotate as a sorority who had the slot. Uh, so it was beautiful wow. to see even that. Uh, they're getting involved in Bible studies. Uh, a lot of them come into confession and, uh, and really like taking advantage of opportunities to go to confession. And so I think in many ways, they know that the sacraments themselves uh, are, are the ways that they can grow deeper in their faith, the ways that they know they can be, they can meet Christ, they can find the healing, they need to find healing. Um, and just to know that, that they are receiving graces and this grace is, is in fact changing the way that they live. No, absolutely. I know a lot of, um, I, I know a lot of non-Catholics, but even Catholics alike, they tend to want physical evidence you know, physical evidence that your sins are forgiven, physical evidence that the Eucharist is actually Jesus Christ. But I also think they're forgetting the point that it's also a mystery. Part of our faith is a mystery. And even though that doesn't look like Jesus Christ in the host, like it is, it might not physically look like it, but it is. And I feel like a lot of times they try to pin science against religion a lot and science against the sacraments um do you have anything to say about science against religion oh, yeah kind of absolutely uh and, and especially in regards to, to the sacraments especially the eucharist you know we would say the science is on our side um this is the thing too is people tend to think that spirituality and science um are against each other and they're not uh and, and you look at some of the most brilliant minds throughout history many of them were, were involved with the church um for example uh gregor mendel uh, we know him as also as Father Gregor Mendel. He was a priest. He's oh, wow. now the father of modern genetics. Um, you know, uh, you look at, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank. He's a, a Belgian Jesuit priest, uh, Lemaitre, Father uh, Lemaitre, mm. uh, who discovered the Big Bang Theory. You right. know, uh, and so you look at some of the most brilliant minds we've had. Many of them were, were involved with the church in some way, and so, several of them were priests. Um, and so what they try to show is that science and religion are two wings of the same bird is often the expression that's used, um, is they can't replace each other, but they, they help the bird to fly. Um, and at least with that, you know, we, we categorize that each one answers a different order of questions. We would say that the, the, the faith questions, these are what we call first order questions. They're questions of why, um, mm. whereas science tends to answer second order questions, which is how. The problem people get into is they try to answer one with the other. You have people who try mm -hmm. to answer questions of science with questions of why. So they're answering how questions with why answers and vice versa. You have people who are asking um, why questions and trying to answer it with how answers and it doesn't work that way. You, right. can't, you can't answer them with opposite, uh, with, with a different order. You have to stay within that order, but they help each other. So with the sacraments and the Eucharist, there's what we call Eucharistic miracles and there's great books on, on Eucharistic miracles and great research. Um, and, and with that, what we've seen is that there have been cases where at the consecration um, that the host has actually turned into, uh, in some sense, either cardiac muscle, the host has bled, um, has turned into an actual heart itself. Um, and we've had scientific tests done on these specimens, um, which in, in, in many ways, the doctors are, are not told what they're being given. They're just told, like, what can you tell us about the specimen in front of you? They have no idea this is the Eucharist. And many of them have said, uh, with modern science, this is some of the most recent science we've had with these tests, is that it is not only cardiac muscle, um, but you could see that it, it's, it's a four chamber heart, uh, which has been put under a lot of stress as of someone who greatly suffered and the blood type is Mediterranean. Uh, and so we have like the science behind all this to say that, you know, there are some times when, when someone doesn't believe in the real presence that these Eucharistic miracles happen most of the times in those cases. Um, not every single time, you know, but definitely that tends to be the common denominator. And so in a sense, the Lord wants us to know, like, this is real. This is really his, pre like, he's, he is here in the Eucharist. Um, and so in that sense, we have the science that can confirm that this is, like, how is this the Eucharist? Well, we can see how, because this is a specimen here. We could see all the different reasons of the cardiac muscle, the, um, the blood type, all these things. Like, that's how we know as opposed to the reason why, because he said so. Right. No, absolutely. That's a beautiful explanation as well. And I always find it interesting because um, I, I know people who have told me, they're like, well, if that actually was Jesus, like, 
I would be in front of him 24 seven begging, begging for his forgiveness on my knees, like crawling up the aisle, like reaching for him. And I thought about that. And I was like, wow, like it is Jesus, obviously, but I feel like some Catholics fall short of believing that nowadays, especially there's statistics to show that very few Catholics nowadays actually believe in the true presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. And that's very sad. And at the same time, in those instances, do you believe those people who still receive the Eucharist in that way are receiving it improperly, are receiving Jesus improperly because they don't believe in the transubstantiation that happens? I don't think it's so black and white. Uh, you know, some of it might be uh, ignorance of their own part. And, you know, we mm-hmm. could distinguish between vincible versus invincible ignorance. So we would say conquerable versus unconquerable ignorance uh, or ignorance that could be overcome. Um, so when I say they're receiving it improperly, perhaps, probably, you know, is it of their own fault? That's where it gets more gray. Um, right. Is, is how well were they catechized? Uh, were they maybe like taught the sense of devotion growing up? Most people, especially in the United States, um, popular piety is dying. Um, and so in a sense, people, you know, growing up, going to the adoration chapel where their parents may not have brought them or may not have really catechized them showed that the, the external faith uh, for them to, to understand that this is Jesus. Um, yeah, it's not very black and white. Uh, and so I, I guess the best thing for us to do is to try to catechize as best as possible. Uh, and for those of us who do believe in the real presence, to manifest that as much as possible with our own reception of communion, with the way that we treat it. You know, uh, for example, what I do when I celebrate mass is usually when I touch the host, um, I will either wipe my hands, my fingers on the corporal, Mm -hmm. uh, which is a designated place for the host to to land on if necessary. Um, Or like when I'm giving communion is once I start giving communion, I keep my fingers joined. um, So that way, you know, I don't risk the particles falling onto the floor. And then I'll make sure I, I, I wash my hands afterwards. And so even that, like people will hopefully look at that and see that if, if this was just bread, he wouldn't be doing that. You know, like he wouldn't have his fingers together like this and not unjoin them until he washed them. Like hopefully that says something. Same way with the way we receive communion, you know, people who receive kneeling or on the tongue, you know, who, who, who manifest a great deal of faith with that, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I think a lot of that has to do with showing that we really do believe uh, and not just to receive it very flippantly. Do you think by bringing back the reverence for the Eucharist, in other words, requiring that people receive it kneeling on the tongue and things of that nature, do you think that would bring back to an extent the belief? I think to an extent, I think it certainly helps. Uh, you know, we I would always go with the authority of the church on this, which allows communion to, to be received standing and also in the hand. Um, in fact, I think in many ways, if I'm not mistaken, in the early church, they received it in the hand. Uh, and so that was more of the apostolic tradition with the fathers. Um, and so, of course, as things develop, you know, the, 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 the sense of, you know, of saying that, like, oh, my gosh, like, if this is what it is, I, I shouldn't put it in my hands, you know, um, I think that does help. You know, um, but again, you know, I, I tend to always default to what the church says and to say that you can receive it standing or kneeling or, or on the tongue or in the hand. Um, so it really just depends. But even you can receive it in the hand and still do it very reverently, um, not just to, to take it and like pinch it or anything like that, like to receive it, like to put your hands in such a way that you are it, it, this posture of having the hands the way they are um, allows you to actually like receive and not just like pinch and grab kind of mm. mentality. So even with that, you know, there's ways that you could do it reverently and there's ways that are not reverent. Right. I mean, I know a lot of times uh, kids are poorly catechized. I think that's one of the biggest reasons that we have such a falling away from the Catholic Church nowadays. Um, But the younger generation seems to be making a comeback, specifically Gen Z, to a more traditional, you know, Latin mass. I mean, many people still go to other rites of the mass, of course. Um, but there seems to be that hunger for that tradition and for the sacraments and things like that. And yet I noticed that most of these people who are like this weren't catechized properly, or they were catechized for First Holy Communion and Confirmation as we usually are, but then at home, they get no catechesis at all from their parents. And do you think that's one of the reasons that kids aren't being catechized properly is due to parenting maybe? Oh, without a doubt. Uh, without a doubt, um, because what tends to happen is, um, a, I think in most, a lot of families, I wouldn't say most, I, know, I do know a lot of families, um, where 
the reality of the family being the primary school of faith is not being realized. Uh, mm -hmm. In many ways, you have families who they'll bring their kids to mass on Sundays, um, or at least you know when necessary. Uh, but other than that, you do you really don't see uh, like uh, like I said, a life of like popular piety, devotions, things like that, living um, in the home. Um, many people tend to think that the church is just going to teach them how to do this. You know, I know for uh, religious education in my area for a long time, like we made the kids go to confession at least once a school year. You know, every school year they would go. Um, we would bring them and introduce them to adoration. And that's the thing is it shouldn't be the church itself having to introduce um, children and young Catholics to things like this. It really should be in the family. Um, and so, yeah, I think the challenge is for families to reclaim that role as being the primary educators and formators in the faith. Um, but you're right, we are seeing a return to not just the sacraments, but sacramentals, uh, and, and, and I'll distinguish that as well. Sacramentals are not sacraments themselves, but they're, they're uh, sources of, of grace and blessings um, that emulate the sacraments in specific mm -hmm. sacraments, like holy water is a sacramental. It symbolizes baptism. Uh, one thing that I see resurging is what's called um, the rite of betrothal. Uh, which in, in, uh, engaged couples are doing again, uh, which is the sense of more formally um, pronouncing the fact that they intend to enter into marriage uh, and, pr and prepare as best as they can in the meantime. Um, so the sense of betrothal, which would be a sacrament of, uh, sacramental of the sacrament of matrimony. So we're seeing things like this resurge. Like, you know, I don't think I've ever been personally to a rite of betrothal, but I'm seeing a few friends of mine who are choosing to do this uh, as they're getting engaged. So it's really cool to see a lot of those things resurge. Absolutely. I actually didn't even know that that was a sacramental, the patrol though, because I've been seeing it like blow up on Instagram. You right. know, many people, young couples are getting betrothed in these chapels and they're being engaged in churches. And that I think is actually beautiful to actually propose in front of the Blessed Virgin Mary, you know, to your you know, significant other, um, or to propose in front of the Eucharist or to, you know, just because I think, I feel like it's very, I don't know if symbolic is the right word, but you are basically stating that this involves you, God, and your partner, and God is the foundation. And so to be engaged in a Catholic church and then do that betrothed uh, sacramental, for me personally, I feel like that's a way of stating like God is the foundation of our, our relationship. And uh, I, I feel like that's just a very bold statement that's very beautiful as well um, that a lot of younger generations are coming back into. Yeah, and not even just with, with you know, making it so intentional, but also like the invitation for God to come in for the, their marriage prep. Mm. Um, which is something that, you know, most people don't get to see until they're going through it themselves, which I see almost on a weekly basis with the couples I get to, to walk with. Uh, we're not just having them jump through hoops. We're, we're actually having them go through a process to make sure that they are as, as ready as possible um, to receive the sacrament of matrimony and to live together as husband and wife. And so I think the betrothal in a, in a very beautiful way uh, specifically invites God into that process of preparation. Um, not just, the, again, you know, intentionally in the engagement that way, uh, but at least to say, like, we, we want God to come in to help us in these next few months leading up to our wedding so we can be as prepared as possible. Right, which I think is so important because especially in today's day and age, you see a lot of failed marriages and things. And um, I feel like all of that stems from not having God at the foundation of their relationship to begin with, because we're told right off from the bat that we are not perfect. You know, God is the only one who is perfect. And so your significant other will, you know, let you down every now and then you're going to get into arguments, but the one person you can always go to is God. And it's very interesting to see because we always look for complete satisfaction from another, but in reality, we get that complete satisfaction from God. And when we expect that from a human, we're going to be let down. And so that's why it's so important to be so united with God in basically like this triangle of love, because without it, um, there's no, it's a very rocky foundation. It's like building your house on sand. Yep, for sure. So it's just one of those things where it's very interesting to think about, but Overall, this was a great, you know, explanation for the sacraments and everything like that. So thank you so much for being here on my podcast again. 
again, my pleasure. And again, thank you for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. I can't wait for your podcast to start up. I'm very excited about that. So good luck with all of that. I'm excited to hear about it in the future. Oh, thank you. And, and definitely appreciate the prayers for, for the planning and, and execution of all of that. And thank you again. Absolutely. 100%. So with all of that being said, I hope all of you guys have a great rest of your two weeks and I will talk to you guys in the next podcast. Have a great day, guys. God bless. Do you have questions or comments about today's episode? Email me at thereligioushippie at gmail.com or leave a voice message at anchor.fm forward slash thereligioushippie. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to A Catholic's Perspective with Amber Rose, The Religious Hippie. Please be sure and rate and review this podcast. This podcast is copyright. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Be sure to like and follow The Religious Hippie on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok, or visit her official website at thereligioushippie.com. This podcast is produced by Todd Fisher and distributed by Metacortex Publishing. And be sure to visit metatomics.org to see our listings of other unique podcasts.